It's just getting down to the basics, being aware of the risks that you carry, and then focus on one of the three things, managing your assets, managing change to those assets, and certainly managing identity. That's your holy trinity when it comes to the basics of what a security program is it is intending to have oversight, monitor, and protect. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jim McDonald. I'm not joined by my co-host Jeff Sedman today. He's still suffering the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. He's basically at the point where he's got electricity and nothing else, including running water. So we wish the best for Jeff. What's fantastic is that he's been editing the podcast in the background. So we'll have this episode coming out this Monday, as we've always done. You know what they say in in the business, the show must go on. Today, I've got a couple of um, discount codes that I want to go over, and then I'm going to introduce our guests. So it's the same discount codes we've been talking about on the recent episodes. But first, let me talk about Sempris's Hybrid Identity Protection Conference, or it's also known as the HIPConf. Um, it runs from November 13th through 14th. The best part is it's in New Orleans. Um, I, which is a really fun city if you haven't been there, but it's going to be a great learning event. Uh, you can use the pot, the code IDAC pod, I D A C pod, and that'll get you 20% off. And then, of course, one of the biggest events in the identity calendar is the Gardner IAM Summit. That's going to be in Grapevine, Texas in December. It, we have a discount code that saves you $375 on registration. Our exclusive code is IDAC375. You're not going to find a better discount code than that. So I highly encourage you to go out there, register for that conference, and use that discount code. So today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. This is somebody that I've worked with in the past, and he's a a friend as well as a, a great mind in our industry. His name is Brandon Pinzon. Uh, he's an insurance industry cybersecurity executive. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jim, and all the best to Jeff as well. I know our thoughts, prayers, and good vibes go that way for sure. Absolutely. And all those that are affected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Brandon, it's, it's tradition here at the Identity of the Center podcast to ask our guests their identity origin story. So how did you get into digital identity Did it choose you or did you choose it? I think I've had the good pleasure over my career of actually having it happen both ways. So in my last role for an employer, I chose it after going through and really experiencing the opportunities to kind of introduce some monitoring elements to identity architecture and engineering. I think that's where our paths crossed. Uh, That was in financial services. Prior to that, I was in the hosting space. And so I had the opportunity to really establish the governance, really look at the transformations, both on how we enter into our customers' environments to do the things that they ask us to do, as well as protecting the estate. And so I was very close to that, especially in running and helping with the security program. But my origin story really happened in banking. You know, I ended up owning the show when it came to identity. And that was the architecture, engineering, and provisioning back when you had security and IT probably a little bit more closer together. You know, how we had the opportunity to kind of start to break it out, really, this is kind of where I think it chose me, uh, was when we were able to go and separate ourselves and then out of necessity, you know, the financial crisis that was taking place, the subprime lending markets, financial scrutiny going up, Sarbanes-Oxley going up, going back and introducing that monitoring element right? That's kind of where it started for me. And so, you know, from applying policy to automating, to sending out the little tangible tokens, to rebadging everybody, you know, the access governance suites all the way through the automation of, you know, recent, 
and looking for fraud, looking for account takeover, looking for how do you streamline, you know, a deal with passwordless types of strategies. Like I've been around for all of this, which has been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It gives you a lot of insight. And, you know, nothing happens without access, identity and access. It's kind of the, the center of identity, if you will, or the center of security, I think. Um, so one of the things that you and I had touched base on and it got me to say, Brandon, I need to get you on this podcast, is we we're going back and forth and talking about where in an organization does identity management belong? You know, does it belong in information security or somewhere else? So I'd like to get your take on that. Yeah, it's one of the wonderful debates. And it's one of the things that, you know, in talking to my my peers in the industry, my peer CISOs, it's it's been fascinating to not only share the perspective, but also kind of also share you know, my personal perspective as well. So I would say, look, when you think about the origins of identity and the purpose, it was really to be measured against delivering service, to get folks into the workforce, to get the right provisioning, to get the right access to the systems and the data that they need to do their job. And, and that was the metric. It was really that user experience and getting it in there. And so by that nature, it's been owned historically in IT. And I think in the last two years, 18 months, as we've kind of seen this kind of focus even more pronounced, in my opinion, on that monitoring element, you know, we've seen the you other know, breaches going up, we've seen root causes, we've heard kind of the taglines of, you know, the adversaries don't just break in, they log in types of things. It's really introduced the opportunity for the security organization to then take on the architecture and the engineering and help pay back some of the debt that I think has occurred over the course of, you know, the, the journey of, of identity. I think that as an industry, we've kind of seen this, I'm going to sort it out later, sort it out later. And I think later it showed up. And so I think that the architecture and the engineering, it's more of a shared fate, right? It's a shared combination, no different than say managing vulnerabilities or managing source code or managing endpoints. There's an element to provide the process, uh, which I believe lives in IT. I believe to apply the right monitoring elements and controls that lives in the security organization and the ability to have that oversight, commoditize the controls, look and build that predominantly lives in the security organization. And so that's a CISO uh, and where we also see the landscape shifting. So there's ample opportunity to do look for that. It provides a better user experience. It provides the ability to stay focused on a lot of these transformational projects. And I think we're going to start to see more of a shift in that direction. Yeah. I, you know, I think what I see a lot in my day job as a identity consultant is that um, workforce identity is probably more often than not in the CISO organization, or at least in, I, you know, in, in technology. Um, whereas I see customer I am in more of a marketing type responsibility. It's like, it's a fast added on and maybe the CISO has a seat at the table, um, but it's more marketing driven. What do you think of that? And do you see that as well? I think that if we treat the two programs with different strategies and approach it, you're, you're definitely aligning for the business with the business. But, but the customer identity problem presents the biggest opportunity to really help understand and drive a better user experience. In fact, I don't think there's any better representation than to give a, a prospective or existing customer a better way to enter into your environment with the right monitoring and controls in place and do so at the onset with the engineering. And so, you know, I've seen them treated separately. I've seen customer identity, for example, live in, say, more of a digital team, for example. However, when things go bump in the night or if things aren't properly monitored, well, then the security organization is brought in to kind of look at it a little bit more kind of reactively. And then, depending on how many incidents originate or your if fraud or account takeover falls under your remit, well, then you're kind of at a disadvantage because you're kind of having to understand again where data is coming in, kind of the, the whole lineage. And so you kind of have some, certainly have some exposure there. 
And then also, it's not uncommon for those types of environments to be kind of commingled with the IT organization, jobs, batches, bots, effectively running to do jobs, but then marrying that along with looking for anomalous behavior, which is a lot of what the security function is looking at. And so things like rate limiting, looking at, you know, brute force, how do you, you know, properly tombstone or isolate a uh, account? And then also, how do you reconcile? Because the same processes apply. You may have accounts and you may be sharing data with customers or third parties in one form or another. How do you know that that's the right individual and they're not sharing credentials if that's how you're using it or that you're not re revisiting them, especially as that relationship grows over the course of time or maybe becomes stagnant? So I think that, you know, while it does differ, there's a lot of complementary process and technology that really helps automate and helps bring that 360 together because that's what we're really after. Yeah, Brendan, I, I think that, wow, that, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, it kind of feels like having a strong identity practitioner background kind of sets a person up really nicely for that CISO role, especially when the identity component becomes part of the responsibility because I kind of feel like folks who are steeped in identity get identity and people outside of identity don't always. What, what do you think of that? I, I think it absolutely rounds it out because in the, in the end, what you're looking to do, whether it's a, a system uh, or it's somebody that's an endpoint user or somebody that's a customer or third party, you're trying to figure out that who, even if it's uh, a non-interactive or a non-human type of an account, right? You're still trying to find that lineage and that traceability to, re again, pr put incidents aside, really get a process to understand the context of what your environment is. And if you don't have that, you're blind. And I think when it gets down to in history, look at any of the reports that are out there that start to trace and trend you know, the root causes of breaches, incidents, reportable events, at some point or another, the, the conversation with credentials is pronounced, right? There is a root cause that's there. It's still an attack vector. Credential stuffing is still a thing. Uh, phishing and looking for accounts uh, is still absolutely a thing. And it's, 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 I think, the gift that keeps on giving if you don't have the right things in place. Yeah, it feels like the the route to understand an attack from a forensic standpoint in the past was based on, okay, can we show that this IP traversed or, you know, these signatures from the device had this, uh, had this you know, path through the systems. But really, it's the identity oftentimes could be changing IP addresses, could be uh, changing devices. So... It feels like the industry is starting to recognize that. You see that with uh, the, the ITDR space kind of taking off. And I feel like that's one of the, the pros for why a CISO should be, or why identity should roll up to the CISO. I, I think a con, at least in my mind, is that the CISO is responsible for setting policies for applications and systems. And now you're saying, CISO, you're responsible for an application. And that CISO may be facing deadlines that he or she has communicated to their boss, to other executives, to the board. And now maybe facing a deadline. I mean, they're going to make my, my date or I'm going to have to roll it back because I didn't get all the boxes checked that I, I need to get checked per my own process. So it's almost like a conflict of interest. What do you think of that? And what are some other pros and cons for, you know, whether or not or having a CISO responsible for identity? You know, I think of uh, certainly the conflict is well described and, and that's well stated. But I think about, yeah, you know, when you set policy, right, you're setting it based on kind of a, a even handshake, right? Just because you're a CISO and you hold a title doesn't mean that you're getting there through 
uh, asserting an authority, right? You're not dominating an IT organization through policy. You're working together to engineer that shared fate. And I think when you know, when you think about what are you preventing or what are you trying to um, pay against or um, or pay down the risk you're trying to pay down, it's really a a total takeover of the source of truth for your identity. Right? If a threat actor take gets access to you know the core of your Active Directory or the core of your identity or the core of those types of services, and they're able to go through and and move uh, pretty much unfettered, well that makes a bad day completely worse. Your cleanup job gets exponentially worse. And so I think the cons come in the form of really the provisioning aspect, right? Going through and expecting that, you know, while you do have context in the, the CISO organization, that there's not going to be friction or that you're going to be held to an SLA and you end up kind of throwing things over the fence. I think that's certainly a, a possible con if you don't enter into the strategy and the transformation in line and lockstep with the IT organizations, because somebody has to go through a provision according to an SLA, just like you have to receive your equipment, just like, or you have to go and receive and make sure that the right reviews happen over the period of time. And we do that through automation, right? At the same time, we want the, the, the identity of, uh, engineers that are on the security organization to sit alongside to understand how the roles are being built. Because if you take something like your HR management system, you take something like a, an Oracle financials or something that's a SaaS or something that's, you know, running your backend infrastructure, those have different roles. And what you're trying to do is build the right entitlement so that especially those privileged roles, you know, have the right ability to go and do what they need to do or experience and have access to that data. Again, so a con is when I think there is an over-indexing or a lack of understanding of what usability and service level looks like with really the stat the responsibility of implementing the monitoring. So if you're both, you know, the the throwing the ball and judging and saying if there's a ball or a strike, there's a problem there. And I think that's where you do need that independence, you need that objectivity, but you do have to have a shared fate and a shared outcome. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting how you put all that. Um, now, I have a, even a fundamental question about what it means to own identity, because it seems to me, you know, some organizations, their identity team has some developers and some engineers, and they're part of the information security uh, team. Other organizations don't want to put their developers in information security. They want to keep them in other areas of the business. Does, does owning identity have anything to do with where the resources report? I think that there's two aspects to resource, right? There's where the human capital sits, and then there's where the budget sits. And they're not mutually exclusive. I recognize that. And so part of what a successful security program looks like is that you're the good steward. You're the good business partner. And not all organizations are going to have, or even, you know, IT organizations, departments under the IT organizations are going to be well-staffed or well-resourced. And so if you're given the opportunity to provide some automation or to provide subject matter expertise or to sit alongside with the teams that pose the highest risk, whether, you know, they're defending or supporting or managing the crown jewels, depending on how your methodology determines that, it's important to understand that, you know, it is a team effort on that piece. And so again, it's not really related to uh, asserting dominance or asserting uh, a level of power over somebody. It's about sitting alongside with them. So what typically happens is you take a look at some sort of a transformation, that new thing, for example, that is going to get built, which may serve as a greenfield for some organizations to then do it correctly. But you also have to manage the entire life cycle. You have to go through and really see it through. These transformations, these identity strategies are multi-year. You know, in many cases, you're doing pretty well if you're looking at three years to start, you know, to depending on how much you're taking on and what you're deploying and what you're rolling out, you're looking at a three-year transformation from, you know, kind of the inception to 
when you start getting things rolled out. And then again, where it really gets challenging is in that provisioning. And then at some point, somebody has to reconcile who has access to that data or someone has to has that reconcile who has access to that system. So removing that friction, and that may sit outside of the, even the IT organization, is an opportunity to score some major points, especially when you're helping not even talk about identity, but talk about a better onboarding experience, less tickets, less reliance on someone you know, to increase costs to go and build something that is not part of you know, the overall process flow. Or have a better customer experience on seeing that new cool thing that coincidentally satisfies a regulatory or compliance requirement. That's a great overview, man. And I think that you brought up so many key points. Folks can go back and listen to this, that section again. They're trying to, you know, make the case to pull identity into information security or, you know, or straight up ask the question, where does I identity belong in the organization. But I wanted to shift the conversation now, Brandon. I, a couple of things I want to go over while I have you here. And the first thing is around um, getting the insurance industry perspective on identity. In other words, how's it different? So I think of insurance as financial services, but I also think of banking as financial services. But I feel like they're two different industry, banking and insurance. And I'm wondering if you agree with that and then kind of how the insurance industry is different when it comes to identity. Yeah. And I think the best way to think about or separate financial services or, or kind of maybe what they share, financial services, the essence of it is to calculate interest in some form or another. And in the banking, you know, depending on the nature of your banking, you're getting there through lending. You're getting there through, you know, savings, deposits, checkings, types of things. And so, you know, with insurance, it's a little bit different because what you're effectively doing is you're, you're selling a promise. It's not necessarily tangible. You're selling a contract and a promise based on a policy that if those conditions are met, right, and uh, you suffer a loss, you will be compensated based on the risk that we've agreed to and effectively what, you know, what the circumstances of your, your loss is when you've adjudicated it. And so when we think about it, they both fall into the same levels of regulated industry, but slightly different. But they still say, share the same problems, certainly, um, which is kind of ubiquitous with other areas as well. So you may have online portals that are customer facing. That's how you get information to and from your customers. However, you know, when you think about from the insurance space, depending on where you sit in the food chain, you know, you may be managing broker relationships. In other words, you don't have on staff um, sales force. You're relying on third parties to go and interact and basically generate the gross written premium or to get information to you so that you can make a decision on whether or not you're going to, you know, insure that particular product. And then it kind of goes down the line from there. At the same time, you know, that term is finite, right? Let's just say you have a year-long policy and you experience no claim, no loss. Well, great. There's no interaction with the claims team. Um, you don't necessarily have that on the banking side, right? On the, on the banking side to draw a parallel. So when you experience a loss, you're working with your claims teams. Well, then you have a whole flurry of information, right? You have to go through and you know, depending on the nature of what it is, you're presenting, you know, medical bills, you're presenting reconstruction costs, you're presenting all sorts of things, depending on the, the nature of what you're insuring. And I'm talking about specialty insurance, you know, personal lines, maybe a little bit, you know, certainly adjacent, but, but kind of nuanced to it. And so on the banking side, for example, you know, you may be getting information to make a loan, right? And so there's, so there's some commonality there in terms of the kind of systems and where it flows. I think the difference when you look at all of the data and the way that you monetize data on the insurance side, there's a tremendous amount of analytical value that's there. And so that the traceability and the provenance of that data, even if you say no to a deal, the fact that you said no to the deal and the data that's contained has analytical value. It goes to the actuaries and they're gonna use that in their models in one form or the other. 
And then if you experience a loss, you know, all of the data that complements it also has a tremendous amount of, uh, of analytical value because you're trying to determine what went wrong to then help ideally inform your customers or your policyholders or your future policyholders on things you can do to prevent that boom or that loss from occurring. So there's a little bit of a nuance there, and I didn't appreciate that until I actually got into that industry. There's a tremendous amount of data, and then the providence and understanding the data or who you invite and how you interact with the data allows for so many ways to really you know, stretch your legs when it comes to practicing identity, certainly in the security space too. Yeah, so you just opened my mind to a, a whole question around that analytical data. Does that lend itself at all to making good identity decisions or is that completely separate? That's just, that's the jewel you're trying to protect or is there any way to tap into that data to maybe authenticate a person properly or to, you know, do other life cycle events like making sure that the person is, you know, still with us here on this earth. Absolutely. So I think, Talking about workforce or enterprise identity, when you when you start to experience data quality issues, it's because you really have not or you've lost control to the axis of where you're aggregating all of the data. And so, you know, part of my experience over the course of time has certainly been privacy related as a former data protection officer, and I've been along with the privacy ride for you know quite a long time. Um, but that when you think about not just using personal data, but protecting all data and the data that you want to have analytical value, you want to control access to that. There's an integrity aspect to it. And so how do you do that? Well, you want to make sure that, you know, the, the, the interactive and non-interactive accounts that are interfacing with that data are absolutely, you know, inspected or monitored are controlled are dormant if they don't need to be, you know, live and, and active. Um, and so, you know, there are strategies to go through and think about that. So from the workforce or enterprise identity side, it's, you know, a, a wonderful feel. On the customer identity side or, you know, interacting with, say, a, a claimant, for example, well, you know, there is insurance fraud, right? And it invites the opportunity, you know, to go through and really authenticate who you're working with and to streamline that, right? Because, you know, the purpose of this is to deliver a good user experience, right? And most times, you know, just think about if you've ever had to file a claim, you're not at a high point in your day, your, you know, situation. And so you want to streamline that and you want to authenticate. And you want to also look for anomalous behavior. And claims fraud is, you know, a thing. And it's certainly something that we're measured on, you know, when it comes in, it presents an ample opportunity and a really good business case you know, for customer identity and re-architecting or engineering and providing a streamlined process to say, okay, I trust you. I've established trust. Let's get the information. And ultimately the intent is money will exchange hands based on the nature of the contract or the policy that you, you have purchased. Yeah. You brought up one other thing that it just triggered a, a, a level of interest, which was thinking of that scenario where, you maybe have a customer who did business with your organization or does business actively. In other words, they're paying their premium every month for the past, you know, 12 years and they haven't logged into their applic logged into your application in that entire time. 12 years ago, your password policy might have been needs to have six characters and at least one number and at least one letter. And you may have moved on from not only that policy, but that entire technology stack. So what kind of challenges does that, does that bring to an organization when you've run into a scenario like that? Certainly. I mean, what, what that provides is uh, a higher risk profile, a uh, higher and an opportunity to really, really threat model and kind of look at the risks that you're carrying because the you know, insurance has been around for a very, very long time. Right. Um, and those systems and some of those core systems have been around um, it, you know, for a long time as well. And they may predate some of the modern uh, advancements in managing identities or managing the whole life cycle. 
And that's not uncommon, especially in financial institutions that have been around for a hundred years. You know, and they they are potentially come to you. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay it back later, right? I'm gonna sort it out later. And so, you know, the challenges are, you know, how do you go through and help effectively retrofit or tag that or make that a candidate to then lower your risk, right? Is that a candidate to go through and you know, effectively replatform and take that opportunity? Or are you going to introduce, you know, compensating processes, which are effectively and unfortunately very painful to do? Because yeah. you know, those serve as, you know, the things that are easy, you can throw in automation. Then there's kind of like this middle ground of things that I don't quite know, but I'm going to sort out. But that's typically what happens at the end of your transformation, because that's the real hard stuff, right? And there are technologies or there, there are certainly processes and really just kind of going and just kind of gritting it out to kind of understand what your baseline is for good. And then you introduce the automation and the opportunity to automate and, you know, address that last percentile normally of kind of where that sits. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking of that scenario that my first reaction was disable the account and make the person reset their credentials. The, the marketing side of me said, no, if they know the password, let them in. I don't think either answer is necessarily the right answer. I think it's the organization has to weigh those pros and cons and come up with their approach. So I, that's a great conversation, a lot to think about. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on, Brandon, is, you know, financial services is a big focus on compliance. And I think the words compliance and security sometimes get intermingled, but I think they, they're different. I think they often have the same goals. So I'm wondering, what are your perspectives on that? Um, when, especially when compliance and security compete for the same limited resources. Yeah. Um, so I love this conversation. Um, it's kind of the intersection, not just with compliance, but the, the risk and the governance pieces to it. So compliance are effectively the way that you've written your, your minimum standards, right? The way that you've gone through and whether it's from a regulatory perspective or whatever is applicable, kind of temper that kind of this is going to be your floor but most organizations really struggle with that because depending on kind of the nature of the stacking of the compliance requirements to you or the acronyms that typically follow depending on how you're governed or if you're a global or multinational organization it gets really really complicated the purpose of all of this though the purpose of these compliance frameworks is really to make you understand your risk Right. And, and to be more aware of the risks that you're carrying, certainly in the identity space. And so, you know, the, if you get down to maybe a principles based approach is, are you aware of how much risk you're carrying? Are you thinking about those? What if scenarios? Are you doing that threat modeling against the system to then, you know, double click on your identity to understand how does your strategy apply? Right. And so. They're very much complementary, but you can certainly be compliant, but not um, maybe compliant, but not secure. Compliance, in some cases, kind of gives you a gray area of kind of how to how to prove it, right? how to generate evidence, or how to you know present to a regulator, depending on if you're attesting or self-attesting to something. Um, but in the end, you're you're trying to describe how you protect your data, how do you protect your systems, and most importantly. How do you prove it? And that optionality and that creative liberty is still the responsibility of the company. And it should be more risk driven, which is a measure of maturity for a security organization than being compliance driven. If you're swimming in compliance problems or you're struggling with your compliance minimums, it's more than likely because you haven't spent enough time really understanding your risk. That also enables you to ben better speak to whether it's your executive team, your business leaders, your peers in your organization, or certainly the folks that through policy, you're trying to get them and working with them to get to a better state. You also have to describe on your journey where you are. The purpose of a risk 
or any type of a roadmap or program is to say you are here today and you are aspiring to be there at some other point in time. And then how you measure yourself across the way is fundamentally what all these compliance and what these regulators are looking for. If you're ignorant to risk, or if you've willfully said, I am aware of the risk and I'm not going to do it in a way that it isn't appropriately documented, that's where you run into trouble. And that's when the negligent word starts to come into you know, the, the conversation. Yeah, and it feels like, um, be, uh, certainly in insurance, when you're speaking to executives of an insurance company, they understand risk. <laughs> and I mean, but so that's your background. Um, and it really helps you speak about risk. But how can people become more able to tell that story of risk? How can they really describe um, taking that risk based approach um, and, and learn how to speak about it? Yeah. I, what I love about it is not everybody has the, op the, the luxury of applying actuarial techniques, right, to your program. And when you think about how most CISOs are enrolled today or assumed a role, and I think this is, you know, across industry, you kind of got there through experience, right? Uh, you got there through, you know, hard knocks, uh, hard knocks with experience and really learning and seeing and understanding what some of those foundational capabilities are. One of which, of course, is understanding identity, right? And so I think the opportunity to go through and really organize around you know, how you start to measure, how you start to quantify risk really depends on the methodology or you know, the, where you are in your journey, right? There are, there are plenty of partnerships out there. There are plenty of methodologies and frameworks that help you go through and understand how do I start to understand and quantify your risk, but you have to spend the time to understand how are you grouping your risks and how are you grouping your assets? And then what are your, what are your loss outcomes, right? If you, are you defending against a data exfiltration or is your system providing, you know, some sort of life support for a particular industry or a particular customer base? Are you going to be dinged if you have a service disruption and you're not able to fund a loan or you're not able to service a customer? So you break a customer SLA. Are you not going to be able to pay out a claim, in which case you're suffering all sorts of contractual you know, issues, especially when you think about you know, everything that's going through, on through Florida right now, right? There are businesses where if they don't get things built, if money doesn't flow, homes don't get built, businesses don't get built, and then you start to see a further decay, right? Yeah. And so I think it, it opens the door and it provides the opportunity to kind of look at all of those business cases. What are you solving for? And then what is the framework and what is the methodology that best applies to my business? The more successful programs are out there looking at how do I start to quantify my risk and then how do I apply that in a what-if scenario versus taking a compliance-based approach and being subject to the ever-changing landscape. Some people are going to think I saved the best topic for last. And speaking of risk, it's a perfect time to bring it up. So... I want to talk about cyber insurance and you've come from an interesting or maybe somewhat unique background where you've been a customer of cyber insurance, but you've also worked for a broker of cyber insurance. And I want to know, I mean, obviously this is something that can go a mile deep, but really what I want to know is from the identity practitioner perspective, what do identity practitioners need to know about cyber insurance yeah so it will appear uh, it, it just to kind of clarify my capacity right I've, I've had the benefit of seeing the changing cyber insurance landscape both as somebody who has purchased cyber insurance over the last 15 plus years or even having the luxury and the privilege of helping look at and see the evolution of cyber risk products and so i've been able to sit on both sides of the desk and, and kind of see that evolve over time, which is fascinating. And I think, you know, if you've ever experienced the, the questionnaires that are like, okay, how much MFA do you have? And do you have MFA on all systems? And that doesn't really help anybody, right? And so 
what you've seen over the course of time is the opportunity and you, you've seen the losses and the, and the benefit of the carriers and even the brokers is that they have access to the loss data. They have access to the claims data, which over the time indicates what took place, what happened, what went wrong potentially over the last 12 months or the last renewal cycle or otherwise. And so, you know, from that perspective, when you start to see more poignant questions or you start to, or they start to look for publicly available sources and there's plenty of incidents and breaches that are publicly available and you start to see the root cause, well, there is a common theme, right? There is a common theme. So you see more you see more pointy questions that are related to identity. And there is the ransomware scare. There are more pointy questions and the opportunity to start to demonstrate maturity, not just in like the tools that you purchase, but in the overall program. And so what good potentially looks like is going back to before you transfer that risk through a cyber insurance policy, how how mature are you or where are you in your journey? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? What is your progress? You know, they will ask questions about, you know, your privileged accounts. Do you have a privileged account management solution? What are you doing for this? And things like that. However, what good potentially looks like is, do you have the data that helps you understand you know, how to potentially configure that, right? Or how to, uh, how to appropriately apply it, how to appropriately prevent a loss from happening. And I think that's a gap in the industry. When you think about what you're trading off in terms of the costs associated with the cyber event, it's mostly legal fees, right? Legal fees, class action lawsuits, uh, dealing with the communications, dealing with levies, fines, and penalties. And so there's still a gap. You don't get, when you file a claim, additional budget from that claim to go and invest more in the identity program if that was determined to be the root cause. And so you see more and more of that. Most brokers, most of the relationships certainly that businesses interact with will sit alongside if you're working with the right broker and talk about these controls and they'll help prepare you for this. And they'll talk about that. It'll be in their top eight or their top six, or their top 12, but it's certainly in the calculus because on the back end where the folks that are developing these products and are able to understand and apply a weighting to a particular control or technology or processes, it's in the top three, most certainly, right? Uh, in the calculus, where if you do not have the right maturity in your program, you may run the risk of being uninsurable. That can come in many forms. It can be coming in those derelict assets that we had talked about earlier, those old things that maybe predated modern identity access management technologies. It can come in the form of, you know, this concept of resiliency. So if you suffer a ransomware event, how do you go through and restore the identity and access management systems that power, you know, your workforce or allow access to your customers so that it's not a service disruption over time? So it absolutely blends in. And I would say, especially going into this next renewal cycle, you're going to see a very, very poignant level of questioning or a very, very refined level of questioning on third party management, right? How do you know who you're working with is who you intend to work with? You're going to start to see a, an absolute affinity to that and a heck of a lot of questioning related to third party risk management, which is how do you manage those non-workforce, but critical partners, contractors, suppliers, that get access to your environment to do the things that need to be done in your, uh, to, to deliver your business. I think you made a really cool point there. And I just want to underline it or underscore it, which was the whole idea of cyber insurance is transferring the risk from your organization to your insurer. And, and that really drives a lot of what you're saying, which is that the insurer wants to understand how are you going to deal with or what what are the controls that you have in place that would help prevent a cyber attack or a, um you know a ransomware type event uh and then how would you be able to recover from a ransomware type event one of the things brendan that i want to pull out of this conversation is thinking as the identity practitioner what are some things that i can be doing to 
help lower my uh, cyber insurance costs or maybe may have been rejected for a policy in the past? What are the things that I could be doing now to better my position? I think one of the strongest relationships you need to form to better your position is working with the CFO organization, right? And so if you have an enterprise risk management function and cybersecurity is top of mind, then you have to make sure that it stays relevant or that you're treating it as a top of mind issue for the company. And the way you do that is by working with the CFO organization because they're the ones that are typically directly buying the cyber insurance policy. They're buying it as an umbrella with, you know, maybe protecting all of their, um, protecting all of their properties that they have, or maybe they're buying directors and officers insurance. You know, maybe they're buying, you know, workers compensation insurance, but that's typically bundled together that way. And so when you think about it and you worry or, or you start to work with the CFO organization, you understand the business and how this flows. Because what you're basically doing with the money that you're delegated with your budget is you're offsetting whatever that cyber insurance policy is. So let's pretend that that cyber insurance policy is worth $10 arbitrarily. And you're given 30 or, and you're given $3 to work with. You have to help tell the story for how your $3 is offsetting that $10 policy through all of the things you're doing. And in the context of what we're describing, your identity program. And so what's challenging, and I think another opportunity for this, the cyber insurance industry or just for the, it, it, the industry as whole is how do you meaningfully pay down that risk, right? You have to apply effectively a weight and you have to manage your risk, but it ultimately comes in the way that you're allocating your budget, the progress that you're making, that roadmap, but then translating it into the dollars and cents that the CFO organizations ultimately look at when they're balancing the budgets, right? They're looking at the money that's coming in and the assets that they carry and the money that's going out. And so I think that's one of the strongest relationships that you need to form. They're the ones that are going to look at the overall portfolio and they're going to go through and start to say, okay, I'm going to transfer this risk versus, you know, directly fund. And most CISOs aren't as formidable in that realm. And it's an opportunity for CISOs to be better business partners to understand how money works, especially in an organization and in IT. If you do that, then you start to understand and have more informed conversations with the insurers, with the brokers. And it's it's a it's a wild, it's a it's a very rewarding journey, but not one that I've heard taken as often. It's really great information what you you know, and I don't think we've covered that on the podcast in the in the past, which is that three dollar investment to save the ten dollars. I really love that kind of thinking, which is what can I do or where can I make investments that's going to yield outside savings? Brandon, are there certain areas where if you make the investments, you're you're going to get more of a return in terms of or is it something that just depends on the organization and where your weaknesses lie? I think it comes in the form of how risk aware you are and those what if scenarios, right? And it, it's, it's hard to give kind of a one size fits all, but the tools to go through and help you apply framework, apply methodology, apply weighting. Like again, do you have a $3 problem related to identity or do you have a $7 problem in, in that context of offsetting $10? Well, how do you determine that? Well, you know, it comes back to that resiliency conversation. If those systems go down or if those systems become uninterrupted for a period of time, do you know how much that's going to hurt you, right? If you're not able to deliver on a promise or a service or a product. And so I think that's where the risk conversation comes in. And so tangibly, right, anything you could do to help build trust, but again, prevent the idea of a password from being stolen and used in a way that's unfettered is, you know, certainly the way to go, right? I think most organizations or most identity programs are leaning towards, you know, the passwordless types of technologies So starting to remove that from the equation. There's nothing to steal, right? Then credential stuffing becomes or, or, or uh, becomes effectively negated. And so then, well, how do you do that? 
right? You have to be further along on your journey to actually establish a level of trust without that, you know, longstanding um, process, right? Uh, or process or stack. And it, when you think about it, it the the principle of least privilege, for example, has been around since like the 1970s, but we're still struggling with applying that into the organization because you're still seeing that be more and more rampant where we're not taking the opportunity to return back to quality. So it's not like, it, it's not the, it's not the, I'm going to go buy it or I'm going to go transform it. It's just getting down to the basics, being aware of the risks that you carry and then focus on one of the three things, managing your assets, managing change to those assets, and certainly managing identity. That's your holy trinity when it comes to the basics of what a security program is it is intending to have oversight, monitor, and protect. Uh, that's really great. Um, last question on this topic. So who's cyber insurance for? Is it small to mid-sized businesses? Is it large multinational enterprises? And are they held to different standards or is it pretty much every organization kind of qualifies for or, or should be interested in cyber insurance? That's a great question. Um, if you're in the regulated space, it's, it's now a requirement from a fiduciary and statutory perspective, right? You want to protect shareholder value. And the idea of what you're offsetting from a cyber insurance perspective is that if you suffer, suffer a service disruption related to a nefarious actor or a cyber actor, for example, or if there is a software disruption, that it leads to a service disruption that qualifies for you to be recompensated based on what the policy is offering. And so regulated industry effect, uh, regardless of size in many cases, or it's typically you know, there's typically a, a size of assets that helps describe, okay, when you start to, to carry that. Now that's if you take kind of a compliance or regulatory lens to it. When you start to think about it, it's more about, you know, what are you looking to offset? What are you looking to protect? Do you have an idea of like what your likelihood is based on what's going on in the world and the average size of the claim? And then can you suffer? Can you, can you go through and pay that bill if it happens to you? Right. And so in many cases, and if you talk to, of course, you know, uh, uh, the insurance industry, they're going to want you to buy more. Right, they're going to want you to buy more insurance, of course. Right, there's there's a there's a, a, a absolute interest in 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 that. However, the reality is, you only get to that point in an informed way if you're better understanding the risk that you're currently carrying. Right, and so, you know, international, publicly traded, most certainly there's regulatory requirements. Uh, but then, even if you are that around the corner law firm, for example, right? There are cases or an educational institution, you know, there are cases where companies that have been financially distressed or on their last gasp have not returned back to business because of a cyber event, right? They weren't able to restore all the intellectual property was ransom and they weren't able to restore back in time. And so, you know, that's the unfortunate truth of kind of where we sit. The insurance, sure, would have been secondary, but you know the basics weren't followed. The whole purpose and the basics for insurance or the, the whole risk world is there is the bang that occurs, right? There's the pre-bang work that you're doing to prevent that from happening, and that there's everything that happens after the bang that comes in the form of the insurance policy. So the better you can get upstream and the better preventative things you could do, um, it you're, you're, you're not wanting to trigger the cyber insurance clauses as a strategy. You want that as a last resort. That's the purpose. So many good nuggets there, Brendan. I really appreciate all the time you spent with us today. I think this is going to be a fantastic episode. Um, before I let you go, we like to finish every episode on a lighter note, something not IT and information security related. So you've been a major voice for San Antonio, Texas, your hometown. And 
I was wondering, what is something people should know, maybe don't know about San Antonio? And we all know about the famous river walk. So it's got to be something else. I love that question. And thank you for asking that. And yes, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of San Antonio. Obviously it's been home for the last 20 years. And I think what's interesting about it is that we're not just known for the river walk and the Alamo, but, but there, there's a vibrant technology com, uh, community here. And there's also a vibrant cybersecurity community that's here as well. You know, between uh, we're the seventh largest uh, city in the nation, but it doesn't feel that way. There's tremendous infrastructure, but there's also over 3,800 cybersecurity professionals in our backyard. And so when we think about that opportunity between the military, the NSA, and private industry and public industry, there's a tremendous wealth of knowledge that exists here. And so what we see is the opportunity you know, to extend the national reach, right? To provide subject matter expertise or, you know, the operational experience, certainly in cyber at, at a national level. And so I think when we think about kind of the relationship between San Antonio and other cities inside of Texas, it is something that I think is a greenfield. It's really a fascinating opportunity to, to grow and tap into the wisdom of crowds that are here. And so what I'd love people to know about is that you know, there's over 450 startups here, a tremendous amount related into the technology space and in the cyberspace. You know, 3,800 cybersecurity professionals with an amazing pipeline of academia and, and transitioning military that are ending, you know, their career and looking to go into private industry or help, help fight the good fight. And so, you know, the opportunity to develop those partnerships or prolong those partnerships is certainly available. And that's something I'm really passionate about. I dedicate my time in academia. I serve as an advisor to various universities here on programming and curriculum related to cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and data science. And, you know, I think there's a great opportunity. And I also, you know, advise a number of startups and companies that are certainly looking to solve these hard problems and need the workforce. And so that's something I'm very passionate about. Well, Brandon, you're a great voice for the city, a uh, great voice for the community. And we'll put your um, your LinkedIn link in the show notes. So if people want to reach out to you, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, for now, I'm going to say thank you, Brandon. I'm going to close this out by reminding everyone we are on the web at idacpodcast.com. We're on Twitter or X at IDAC Podcast. Of course, you can hit our YouTube channel by going to IDACpodcast.tv. And we're on Mastodon. I think we're still on Mastodon, which is at IDAC Podcast at infosec.exchange. You can connect with Jeff, myself, and Brendan on LinkedIn and subscribe when new episodes come out. We'd love to. Uh, make sure that you know every time we have a new episode. So I'm going to just say thanks, everyone, and talk to you on the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.